Hello, and welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Now, for my regular listeners, I'm going to update you on my upcoming road trip. And for new listeners, welcome. You're going to get a little insight into my life before I get to the good stuff, before I get to the interview. So with our upcoming road trip, I have been trying to pack in podcast interviews um, just so I won't have to do as many on the road. And now I know why I space them out. It has been, I've been recording two a day some days, which is a lot for me and it is exhausting. On the flip side, I've talked to so many great people. So I'm really excited, even though some of them won't come out for a couple months. And of course, it doesn't help that my sweet two-year-old child gave me the lovely pink eye along with a virus. She's such a good sharer. And so I now I have that. But on a positive note, our house is under contract and we didn't even have to officially have it on the market. It was in that coming soon phase. And we were going to do all these updates to our house because honestly, it needed them and put it on the market and, and leave. But someone bought it as is and we don't have to do anything at least until the inspection report comes back, which happened today. And we were out of our house for five hours, starting at eight o'clock in the morning, which was a little rough. So our journey in the RV and our cross-country trip starts on April 9th, and I'm having such mixed emotions. I am so excited about our upcoming journey, but I'm very sad to leave a place that I've been in Raleigh, North Carolina for 18 years, and I have wonderful neighbors. So who the people who buy our house are going to be lucky people. So stay tuned on more uh, next week. We are still waiting to get our truck back. It was delayed yet again. Um, and then we are going to, we picked out our RV. So as soon as we get our truck, we'll get our RV and start, start working on that. But I'll continue to keep you all updated. I've even finally got on Instagram. I feel like an old person. I am finally on Instagram and I plan to post pictures about our journey soon. Now on to today's guest, Chuck Gillespie. Chuck Gillespie is the CEO of the National Wellness Institute. He has seen firsthand the importance of connecting people, processes, and strategies. His work in the wellness industry has been recognized and utilized nationally and internationally. Over the last 20 years, Chuck has developed numerous workplace and community initiatives, as well as evaluated and consulted with hundreds of organizations on wellness strategies. He's a former human resources executive with responsibilities that included leading workplace wellness efforts that resulted in a substantial financial and cultural impact to the company. He has spent time in the classroom teaching for Purdue, IUPUI, and Indiana Wesleyan University. Chuck holds degrees from the University of Indianapolis and Purdue. Chuck's passion is hard to miss, and you're going to hear it all over today's interview. And he is happiest when spending quality time with his wife and daughter doing whatever they want to do except shopping. Come on, Chuck. Shopping's fun. In today's interview, we talk about how Chuck's background has prepared him from the, for his current role at NWI. And he does have a great background, and it, it just feels like it, so many strengths that lend itself to being executive director. He also talks about where he sees wellness going, and he walks us through the new vision, mission, and strategy at NWI. And again, you'll hear his energy is just contagious. Now, Chuck tells us why their upcoming conference theme is called Reimagine Wellness. And of course, he leaves us with this tangible tip. Now, one of the things that I love about what Chuck is doing is his desire to collaborate. It was shown early in his tenure at NWI when he partnered with Wellcoa. They brought a webinar with the Harvard study. You know, the Harvard study, you know, the one about BJs and their worksite wellness program. And I'm excited about our collaboration, Chuck and I. So I'm going to be kind of sharing my podcast with NWI listeners. And he has given me some memberships to the National Wellness Institute to give away this year. So here for the first giveaway, here's what you're going to do if you want to participate in my little contest. I am going to select one listener who shares this episode, preferably with what you learned, on LinkedIn. And I want you to tag me and I want you to tag Chuck. I'm the one giving them away, so make sure you don't forget to tag me, but also tag Chuck since this is this episode is all about him. I'm going to look at those who share the episode, who tagged me by February 29th. So you have until the end of the month and just, yeah, shout it out on LinkedIn. Now, before we dive into today's interview, let me tell you about this week's sponsor, Realize Wellbeing. 
Realize Wellbeing is a corporate wellness consulting and training powerhouse on a mission to help companies understand how they're impacting their own employees' well-being. They are dedicated to transforming workplaces into businesses that exude energy and innovation through their vibrant, thriving people. Owner Maggie Goff gets a lot of requests from workplace wellness and HR practitioners who want a fresh perspective on their work and increased capacity for organizational change. In order for Maggie to reach more organizations, she is now offering a brand new Train the Trainer program. This four-week course equips you to bring their innovative strategy to your workplace and also helps you expand your efforts beyond health promotion. This course will help you develop new strategies for your company using the science of self-determination theory and micro-influence. With this new Train the Trainer offer, you'll receive two trainings to deliver to your employees, two fully developed campaigns, a measurement tool, plus four one-on-one coaching sessions with Maggie to support you in your implementation. The April session has limited availability, so sign up today. You can visit realizewellbeing.com or you can contact Maggie directly at mgoff at realizewellbeing.com. I will link all of this up in the show notes, her website, her um, contact information, and I highly encourage you to reach out to Maggie and find out more about this, uh, this course. She is a friend, a wellness colleague, and someone that pushes me to think differently as well. So I know you're going to learn a ton from her if you take advantage of this opportunity. Again, you can visit realizewellbeing.com to learn more. Now, without further ado, I hope you enjoy this interview with Chuck Gillespie. As always, thank you so much for listening to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness, your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, Corporate Wellness Consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. Chuck, welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. I'm so glad to have you on today. It's a joy and honor. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Me too. And I think the best place to start is with your very interesting background. I mean, from legislative assistant to head of HR (laughs) to executive director of the Wellness Council of uh, Indiana. You just have such a variety of experience and a really great track record of growth. So talk a little bit about you know, maybe how, what you've learned over your experiences that really influence your work at NWI today. You know, I think it really transcends. And when you start to think about the root definition of wellness by Dr. Halbert Dunn from the 1950s and thinking about that conversation around functioning optimally within the environment, it, it really does make... A, a very interesting dynamic in, in understanding how culture and environment within a workplace, within a community um, are, are very critical in what's being happening. But at the same time, thinking about what the policies, what the uh, you know, the protocols and the procedures really do um, it build out in that weighing of, of what we're doing, even from a health and wellness perspective. There's so many things, even legislatively, that we can start to talk about um, when you look at where you know policy and environment have come together and really driven our health uh, and 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 overall well-being, or maybe has it hurt it? And so those are some of the conversations that we tend to have a lot of a lot of times. So when you look at that root definition of functioning functioning optimally within the environment, maybe we are because the environment right now may not be conducive to having a strong health and wellness background. So. Having that experience both at, at the at the legislative body as a legislative aide um, in the HR world, and then uh, you know running the Wellness Council of Indiana, and now with the National Wellness Institute, it, it really is kind of fun because I really have taken just about everything that I have done over the last say 25, 30 years, and and culminated into uh, an area that is truly passionate and uh, really exciting about where we can take it, not only in the United States but globally. Yes. And so you've, you've been executive director where you have a national wellness Institute. I always call it NWI because I'm so lazy. I can't even say a national <laughs> wellness Institute. I'm good with that. <laughs> for, we, they, they know who we're talking about, what we're talking about. So you've been there for a year ish, a little bit over. So now that you've yep. had time to settle in, 
talk to us about what you've observed over the past past year, and then we'll get to the future in a minute. I think when you look at where where wellness is currently and where it is going, when you think about it being a four point two trillion dollar industry, but there's really no leadership per se. Um, it's still somewhat of a wild wild west out there. I, I make the comments that you know people that are as clinically uh, health driven as like say cardiovascular surgeons are using the term wellness, and so are people that clean carpets for a living. And I'm not saying that either one are are not equally important, but that's really a wide definition of what wellness is. So, you know, in the six years that I was with the Wellness Council of Indiana and these last year, a little over a year that I've been with the National Wellness Institute, I think a lot of the things that we've really got to understand is how do we make sure that we are looking at expanding the innovation and the technologies that are out there and and really making sure that those technologies and innovations, you know, are are truly built to to, to take on uh, what we want to do from a functional, optimal uh, perspective. Uh, We've got to build more partnerships and collaborations. I think there's too many things that are going on out there in the world today that you know, it's such a wide open space and it's such a blue ocean, so to speak, that, you know, building these key partnerships and collaborations is going to be a very critical factor of what I see where we are today and where we need to go. And again, continuing to look at what it's going to take to put the tools, the resources and the trainings around our wellness champions to ensure that they have everything that they need so that they can go out and change the world for us. And that's really where our vision and our, and our mission statement have changed and, and our strategic plan is really driving that conversation. And that's something that we have over the last year uh, reestablished within the NWI and, and looking forward to what we want to do and how we want to take on this $4.2 trillion industry. Well, there's a lot in there, Chuck. So let me let me go. Let me go piece <laughs> oh, by piece. Come on, that was nothing. <laughs> oh, really? Next question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's just keep moving on. Nope, nope, we're digging into it. So tell us talk about technology. You said expanding innovation and technology. So define technology for me because I know it's it's a little bit of a um you know, I know we need technology and there's different camps in the, in the wellness industry that people are like, yes, technology, and some people are like, no, there's already too much out there. We need the personal relationships. So tell me more about what what your thoughts are on technology and how to expand it. I think really when you think about, and again, I'm going to define technology and innovation in two different ways too. So um, I'll uh, give you a heads up on that. When I think of the term technology, it's really optimizing the technology solutions for a more efficient and effective operational management. So I'm actually a believer, and again, this is coming probably from my HR world as well. I still believe that the technology needs to be behind the human being. What I really want to see is technology optimizing people so that we can scale some of the programs, the tools, and the, and the resources, and the, and the connectivity uh, to do so. And when I think about the technologies, I'm not even just talking about the portals and the you know, challenge programs and so forth. When you think about the technologies, it's really looking at making sure that people are spending a little less time on the administrative side of things and a lot more time on the operational pieces of how to move a wellness initiative forward, whether that's in the community, whether that's in a uh, workplace. But when you think about it even specifically from the rural side versus the urban side versus the uh, lower socioeconomic areas, there's so many opportunities where, let's face it, we're we're not going to be able to get a a high-level wellness champion in all parts of the rural America or, or all over the world So utilizing those technologies to make sure that there are the abilities for those folks to learn and grow so that they can take those ideas, thoughts, and and procedures and build that within their own tribe or their own community. So that's really, to me, where technology has got to go and where we and we can't just throw it out there in front of everything and and expect uh, success. Because, you know, what I see in technology is we can get away from a one size fits all mindset and really get into that that customizable one size fits one uh, solution. So that's where I see technology uh, from the wellness side. Yeah, thanks for explaining that because it is like when you think about how wellness programs are done today, it is so administrative. 
like they're, they're tracking things, they're registering people, and they are not going out there and building their relationships because they've got all this admin work uh, that they're having to do. So yes, that would be fantastic. Can you, can you guys get yeah. on that? <laughs> well, you know, it, it's funny because if you really look at, and, and again, I, I just go right back to the um, recruitment world. When, when you're trying to recruit new employees, the organizations that I have seen being the most successful in recruiting great talent are the ones that utilize their technologies just to get the administrative things done. And then they put the humans in front of it and actually do the training and education programming, the, the, the interviewing and so forth. So it's still very much a fundamental piece. And, and, and so that's where wellness has got to get to. We can't just think that it's going to be, uh, you know, done with technology because this is very humanistic. It's a, it's, you know, it's, it's a very different mindset. So that's really what I'm, I'm excited about and where I think we can really make a difference uh, going forward and looking at some of those tools and saying, you know what, it's a great innovative tool, but how about we, and then kind of move it from there. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think it's really going to help with that. I hope so. And then we think about the innovation side. And again, this is where I think it's very interesting because when you think about innovation, I will say, you know, when, when I look at innovation, this isn't just technology. What are some of the trends? What are some of the, 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 the pieces that are going forward? And, and again, I'm going to take a great example of, you know, I think, I think one of the innovative things that's happening in the, in the wellness field today is the, um, for lack of a better term, bringing mental health out from under the rug or out of the closet or however you want to say it. Even 10 years ago, when I was the head of HR for an organization, when we talked about those terms, mental health, we were, we were basically talking about taboo things. People didn't talk about that. Um, when I brought up things like, hey, we've got an employee assistance program, typical reply to me was, well, I'm not crazy. And it's like, that's not what we're really trying to you know, get to. We're trying to get to the point where we're trying to help you understand what's going on. So when you think about the mental health pieces and you start to look at some of the technologies, and, and I get excited about it because, again, therapists, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists are, are very hard to get in mm-hmm. and because there's, there's such a demand for it. But utilization of some of the technologies, some of the video conference type of stuff will really help us in getting more people access to these much needed help. And and so that's where I see that innovation coming in. And then you start to look at things like genetic testing. You know, that's still kind of on that fringe. But I, I truly believe, and again, hearing from some of the folks at the National, National Health Institute or National Institute of Health, I should say, even making the conversations of saying they anticipate uh, genetic testing uh, to be somewhat streamlined or somewhat in the in the mainstream um, in the next two to five years, and so we get excited about those kind of things because again that brings back that customization and and that one size fits one mentality. Yes, yes, and it's an exci- it's exciting right now where mental health is. I mean, it's it's kind of getting some attention. Same with financial uh, well-being. So uh, it is an exciting time and I know that we can do so much more. So yes, more to come. And and even the things like I'm working with a client on telemedicine and getting a Telemedicine is not a new solution in any way, but there's a traditionally a low in, uptake by employees. Um, but this is going to be a piece where it is behavioral health as well. So I'm super excited about getting that linked up with this group because, as you said, it's hard to even get a provider half the time. So. Oh, absolutely. But but what's really interesting that I've seen, and again, when you talk about it, I get excited about having these these telemedicine pieces, these telehealth um, um, successes because. But but what's very interesting is again I, I worked with an organization that um, you know did an did an onsite nearside clinic at at their uh, corporate headquarters and then they put one in one of their uh, factories in a, in a more rural area and what was interesting was is they didn't have a lot of success with people utilizing that onsite clinic come to find out. And again, hindsight's twenty twenty. Come to find out that this is a community that hasn't had a hospital within fifty miles of this of this community in in generations. So they only knew to go to the doctor when they were either near death or deaf. Mm-hmm. So you had to actually reconnect and communicate exactly what it is, what a primary care physician does, 
what it is that you know you can do to kind of make sure that you're taking care of yourself and preventing some of the things that are going on from the health side. So even the telemedicine piece, I think, you know, it's definitely becoming much more of a mainstream. And I'm a, I love my telemedicine programs because I'm, I'm also one that doesn't like to sit in a room full of people with the flu. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, on, I'm an advocate. I'm an advocate of it. Something fierce. So that's what I get excited about, Jen, is, is really looking at doing these things. But we've got to remind ourselves that there is a still a, a communications, a competency type of aspect to all of these pieces. We can't just throw it at them and say, here you go. Mm hmm. Yeah, God, no. There's a, no, just like you said, you need to understand the situation you're, you're even walking into, like you were just talking about. So yeah, thanks Thanks for explaining those. Now, I do want to touch on the partnerships and collaborations, thinking that's a critical factor. In what way would you all look at partnering or collaborating? Is it with, you know, I'll just, I don't know, okay, I'm going to start making up stuff, <laughs> but I, I won't do that. Like, what, what, what's behind that? You know, I think when you look at partnerships and collaborations, it's working with organizations of like-mindedness that could help us in being that that expert in a specific area, whether it's a, you know, maybe it's an association specific to, say, health coaching or maybe specific to uh, financial wellness. For instance, we do have a great partnership uh, with an organization that really helps us in building some of those financial wellness tools. NWI cannot necessarily be the uh, expert in every single aspect of wellness. We would rather be, in, 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 in all honesty, we'd rather be that voice to make sure that the tools, the resources, and the trainings are, in fact, there for that community to, to be able to thrive. So we're starting to look at many more partnerships all over the world and bringing... Um, not just the research and the evidence side of it, but actually, uh, you know, we're, we're in the process. We just signed a partnership agreement with an organization that is uh, very actuarial based. So we're really looking at the actuarial science and the psychology around taking some of that information and being able to say, OK, here's the evidence. Here's actually how it, it can actually be done. And here's the measurements around it. So we're really trying to build those kinds of partnerships and and uh, key uh, collaborations uh, to, to do that. And it may be with some of our, uh, you know, I would say our friends, uh, you know, folks like, uh, you know, Welco and Ryan Piccarelli. He and I have been friends for years. Uh, Hero, uh, National Business Group on Health, Invest Business Group on Health, other organizations like that. Anytime that we can actually look for ways to collaborate, especially as we start to try to better define what wellness is, it's just going to be a stronger, better, more effective uh, opportunity for all of us to, to, to be able to be successful in doing exactly what we want to do, and that's enhance that wellness champion so that they can be uh, the best that they can be. Mm, very nice. Yes, it, it takes some maturity to look at partnerships. I, I know that when I, when I worked at uh, a health plan, I, I was really stuck in the, well, our team has to, has to do everything ourselves, or we as the health insurer need to do everything our, ourselves, when really, no. Like, there's so many great uh, partners out there that you can leverage what they're really good at and then leave you to do what you're really good at. Um, well, and Jen, I, I, you know, the way I look at it is, is why spend a whole bunch of money on yet another 10,000 step program? Um, when there's 500,000 already out there, we don't need another one. We actually need to take those dollars and put them towards that next piece. So when we start to look at what's moving forward, for instance, you know, in 2019, the great example, we started to look at all these diversity and inclusion programs that are, that are being thrown out there. And again, I looked at it in that HR mindset, our, uh, you know, some of our, uh, 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 subject matter experts in this field that we work with internally looked at it in their in their different viewpoints. And what we found was most of the diversity and inclusion training programs really are more about making sure that there's policies in place and there's governance around it, which is very critical. But there really wasn't anything specific to building a implementation strategy so that you could actually do something from a multicultural competency perspective, looking at that whole lens, making sure that you're, you're, you're building something so that people all feel comfortable and belonged uh, to that, uh, you know, to that organization. So if somebody who was say um, Muslim female, um, African-American Muslim female 
would feel comfortable being who they are and they didn't have to come in and try to be something else that they aren't. So those are the kind of things that we saw. We didn't see an avenue there, which is why we built our multicultural competency training program. Uh, Whereas, like I said, with financial wellness, we were like, there's plenty of them. There's great ones out there. We vetted one in particular and we picked one. So those are the kind of things that we really see and, and say, you know, let's, let's, let's really build those collaborations and, and work with the subject matter experts. You know, Chuck, you didn't even see my questions ahead of time, but that was one of them because you, you know, NWI is one of the few wellness organizations actually addressing what I consider inclusion, diversity and inclusion with that multicultural competency. So I, I just want to commend you all for it. And I guess we're not talking about that in the workplace. How do we, or how are we inclusive to all populations? But one other thing that I always uh, it's the same. I'm a dietitian by training. It's the same with dietetics. It is a predominantly female, white profession. And we just continue to, to kind of look, we all look the same, if you will. Uh, is there any work on how do we get from NWI on how we actually get diversity in our own field of health promotion? I, I think so. And, 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 you know, it's funny, Jen, we can even go back to the uh, technology side of this. If you really look at who, who, who is writing the code? It's a predominantly white male uh, mm-hmm. code writing. And that actually, that's actually a conversation our multicultural competency committee is actually having some conversations around is, is there even some bias, even within technologies that is more, in, maybe not on purpose, but yeah. if you think about how it's written, that's another way to do it. Are there ways, you know, I think it really goes back to, and again, I think Robert Wood Johnson came out with a really good graph uh, just this last summer uh, using bicycles. And, and it was talking about equality versus equity. You know, equality is giving everybody the same size bicycle, no matter whether you are uh, short, tall, you know, disabled versus, you know, equity means, you know, a tall person gets a bike that's a little taller, a smaller person gets a shorter bike. Somebody that is maybe disabled gets a pedal bike with their hands. And it's really looking at that. Well, our multicultural competency committee took it to another step and they said, let's eliminate even the system's barriers around those kinds of things. So, you know, it's great to get the equity piece, but then how do we make sure that our policies, our procedures, our environments are conducive so that everybody feels comfortable? So that person that is disabled with the pedal bike is comfortable being able to ride in those areas that um, that are safe and, 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 and equitable for them as well. So those are the kind of conversations that we continue to have, and I'm excited about it. And, and again, um, it's we're working on a partnership with that whole multicultural competency area. Can't talk to it too much because, again, we haven't fully vetted the, uh, the final piece of it. But I can tell you the goal is to really build a whole picture around what that what that looks like. And um, it's been a lot of fun. And we've got some great folks that are, are really helping lead those uh, lead those conversations and uh, looking forward to seeing where that goes uh, beyond, because it is definitely a huge opportunity for the wellness community to to really embrace and and understand that it is it is a wellness and a well being issue. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think it's fantastic you all are doing that. So I'm going to stay tuned and see what you come up with. I think it's it's fantastic. Now, I need to go back to something I think you said, and I want to clarify, but you said it and then went on. (laughs) So I want to make sure I didn't miss here. Did you say that the national, the the vision and the mission of NWI have changed? Yes. Okay. Tell me more. When you really look, uh, when you look at, we we went through a whole strategic planning process over the last, um, you know, six months, seven months. And, and in starting to look at what it is that we really need to be thinking through, uh, we really thought we needed to focus in kind of what our mission and vision are really about. So now our mission is really to enrich the lives and careers of the wellness professional. And by doing so, by serving, and yes, I am reading, uh, as the global... <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, I got to be I got to be real here. Uh, <laughs> serving as the global professional network for connecting disciplines of wellness. And when you think about the disciplines of wellness, we've got our six dimensions of wellness. We want to make sure that we're not just looking at the worksite side. We've got to look at the, 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 the community piece, the individual piece, the coaching piece, the clinical side. Um, you know, the holistic people. Uh, folks, uh, you know, it, it, we've really, in, in, the, in order to really make a true comprehensive holistic wellness initiative, whether it's at the workplace, in the community, 
um, or in your neighborhood, you've got to look at all factors. We want to provide those education and training programs that promote lifelong learning. To me, I think one of the biggest things that you see there's an interesting uh, there's there's some interesting studies out there that talk about the fact that once you reach 40 years old, your social network actually is a better indicator of your lifespan than your health indicators. So thinking about it from that perspective of do you have people, you know, it's that ever famous, how many people would you feel comfortable to call at three o'clock in the morning if you had an issue? You know, I'm very fortunate. I have a number of folks that I would would would, would feel comfortable and confident to make those calls. Mm-hmm. But if you start to ask those kind of questions, I think the statistic was that somewhere in the 40 to 50 percent range don't feel like there are 40 to 50 percent of the population that do not feel like they have anybody they feel comfortable or confident to call at three o'clock in the morning. And that just blows my mind. Because again, when you think about that family and friends network, that social piece, it's such a critical factor. So I think that's a very important piece. And then again, identifying representative, inclusive, whole person, professional standards and competencies. We continue to want to help define what wellness is looking like. And when you think about it from that perspective, then our vision statement, and again, we very much went to a very simplistic way to say it. We at the National Wellness Institute want to be that worldwide voice of the wellness community. And what's great about that is, is that's something for anybody you know, within NWI and within the community to be able to say. And I think one of the things that we saw with our previous vision statement was that it was about four paragraphs long. And as we all know, um, I know I am, I, I need something pretty simple. Yeah. And but effective. And if we can say those kind of things, then that's really what it is. So that's really where we are from a mission and vision statement. And again, everything that we've talked about since then has really been built off of our strategic planning model. So excuse my ignorance on this, but how is that different from what you were all doing before with your mission? Because you've always been focused on the lives and careers of wellness professionals. And it, it seems as like you you have been kind of holistic, you know, with, with your approach. So is there what am I missing? Like how, how is- you're, you're not missing a lot. You're just, we just really came in and honed in and defined exactly what we want to be. So it didn't really change a huge piece, but what really made the big difference was it gives us that leverage to be able to say, you know what, we don't necessarily within the NWI have to build it ourselves. We don't have to design it ourselves. We can actually key it in and, and look at ways to kind of build a whole picture and a whole connection. Um, if you really think about NWI, 15, 20 years ago, roughly, was, you know, NWI was really just a conference. And we, you know, over the last, say, 15, 20 years is really when you started to see NWI starting to add some of the training and education programs throughout the year and starting to kind of build a, a much more comprehensive network uh, worldwide in, in kind of helping bring those, those wellness professionals together. Uh, really what we've done with our, with our strategic planning going forward is updating it, getting it a little more honed in. And, and like I said, our vision statement, I'm, and I'm not kidding when I say this, our vision statement, I think was two paragraphs long and now it's one sentence. And so that's really what we did was we, we just focused and, and we're, we honed in on exactly what NWI needs to be and wants to be. Got it. Thank you for entertaining that question. <laughs> My pleasure, Jen. This is, this is what it's all about. And I'm always having a good time doing it. I can tell that definitely comes across. <laughs> so you wrote a few LinkedIn posts and I just want to go into them you know, one was a little bit of uh, the strategic planning that you've already talked about. So I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything there is that you, you wrote a LinkedIn post asking where wellness will be in three to five years. And I think maybe Bob responded, Bob Merberg, our friend, and has some great suggestions. Um, did you get much uh, of people chiming in there? And um, I guess I'll just leave it there. Did you get much from that post? Did you get people reaching out and giving their opinions? Not as much as I was hoping. And, and again, you know, it's always great. It's always great to get Bob Murphy and, and his insight because, <laughs> you know, there's there's a whole lot of really strong thought leadership and just a little bit of sarcasm, and that is such a strong uh, one-two punch. And and anytime that you can get you know great thought leadership and some sarcasm, um, I'm going to read. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's an excellent so, writer. Excellent. 
Exactly. And, and so, but I love, you know, I, when you start to look at where a lot of the thought leadership is coming from, and I think this is an opportunity uh, for all, you know, all the organizations like NWI out there. Um, I think there's still, and, in, 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 you know, my friend and mentor, D. Eddington, I think said it best about a year ago. He said, when you really stop to look at it, today's research is all coming from the vendor side. And we've got to get it back into the academic side. And I so agreed with that comment so much. And we really want to start to kind of build a little bit more of that. We don't want the, you know, X organization says we're great according to ourselves. We want to make sure that, you know, the information that is getting to the decision makers at workplaces in communities at our, at our federal government level, at governments all over the world, do in fact meet some of the criteria that we need it to meet. And that is that it is that it is academic based, it's evidence based, but at the same time, it's not necessarily based on 20 years, uh, you know, on research from 20 years ago. It's based on research that is current and is looking forward. And and some of the problems you do run into, and again, I totally respect it because, you know, in order to have research that is, you know, really solid and really strong, it does take time to vet all that research. But we as an organization and as a community and as a work site and, and, and all over the country, we need to start to also understand that, you know, we've done quite a bit in the last five to 10 years when it comes to wellness, health, equity, you know, just mental health, et cetera, that we can't wait 10 more years to, to say, oh, yes, this is now valid information. We, we see it. We know it. And it's, it's, it's going to take an organization like NWI to be able to say, you know what, it, it still may not be technically validated from you know, a deep-rooted academic research piece because it's going to take 20 years or 10 years to get that, that validation. But NWI is seeing the success, seeing the motivation, seeing what's going on. And we're ready to move forward with it. So that's really what we need to be doing. And then we need to get our partners to chime in and, and agree with those kind of things. And we need to agree with some of the things that are happening with our partners as well. So what about the most recent research, the one that came out with the song study with Harvard, and then, of course, the University of Illinois study that came out a couple of years ago? So what, do you, what did you all do with that? Because, I mean, that's some significant research that is contributing. Absolutely. And it's very good contributing information. And actually, if, if you recall, last summer, we actually uh, teamed up with Welcoa oh, yes. and, and did a, did a, uh, did a <laughs> webinar with Dr. I Fong. was on it. I was on it. I forgot about that. I know you were. Between you all. That was awesome. Okay. Yeah. And we were really right. excited about it. And, and I will tell you, when you think about what Dr. Song had said in that research, and if you really read into the research and, and, and start to look at what's going on, when they say things like, you know, based on the evidence that we had, you know, the wellness program itself did not significantly alter any kind of healthcare costs. Well, no, it's not going to. It was a $200 a person type of program. So if you're trying to alter, say, a $13,000 problem, which is what healthcare costs are today, you got to think about it from a, a totally different mindset. And that is, you know, what what would be a significant alteration of your health care costs in a workplace today? And you've got to look at it from probably three or four different factors. Factor number one being, okay, what are the premiums that are being cost and how much is the company picking up on that premium? Is it 50%? Is it 70%? Is it 100%? Number two, when you look at it from the, are you on a high deductible health plan? Are you on a, you know, are you on a, on a traditional plan? But let's say you're on the high deductible health plan, which is what BJ's is on, and you look at the fact that it's a $2,500 minimum out of pocket before you start to even get into a health care hit, quote unquote, on your health care plan, then you start to look at it and say, okay, between the premiums and the $2,500 out of pocket for that employee, you've got to start to get to the point where you're saying, okay, we've got to see about a five thousand dollar hit on success in order to make that you know to make it a quote unquote significant piece what dr song said to, to ryan and i even before we got on the on the uh, webinar was while they while, while bj's was about a two hundred dollar a person program 
even in the 18 month period of time, they did see a net gain of about $486 from that $200 program. So if you look at it, that's a two to one success rate, but a $486 return on investment, so to speak, on a $10,000 or a 15 or a $12,000 problem is insignificant. So starting to look at it from just a slightly different perspective, this is one of the reasons why, and I think you see it on a lot of my LinkedIn posts, when we start to try to measure what wellness is, we're trying to say this wellness program isn't fixing healthcare. Well, okay, (laughs) that's great. Guess what? Healthcare is not fixing healthcare either. So let's, Let's kind of let's figure out what we need to do to fix healthcare. Wellness may be a contributing factor and a help, but when I start to look at it, and again, this is just my background in finance coming out, I look at things like avoided costs. I look at things like, you know, making sure that the community itself is healthier so that we're actually employing people that are already healthy to begin with. If we've got 25 year olds that are already coming into my company with type 2 diabetes, Guess what? When the carriers start to see that, they're going, wait a minute, <laughs> those 25-year-olds you know, 30 years ago were the ones that were keeping our costs down so that we could keep the 50, 60, and 70-year-olds um, you know, that are actually going to be utilizing it because, let's face it, Father Time is undefeated. We've got to start to understand that if you don't have that healthy generation coming in, then you know, you are going to see increases in costs. So what can we do to make sure that these happen? That's why I say a workplace has got to get much more involved in their communities so that they understand that when they're hiring these people, these people are healthier and and, and more excited and more interested in it. That's why campus programs, that's why uh, other programs that are, that are in that 18 and under range are, are such critical factors. I can say it with, if you start to look at obesity rates in the United States, especially, Look specifically at the 18 to 26 range and see where a lot of those healthcare costs are are coming in. Because what happens when you're 18? You start to make your own decisions. You know, you're no longer, you know, going to high school and eating lunch at the high school lunch and you're not on this kind of set plan, whether you go to college or even, you know, just out of college and going into your own life. You start to make other decisions. What are the social dynamics around that? Well, you know, let's face it, when you turn 21, there's certain things that tend to happen. You know, are you in a culture where cigarette smoking is just part of the norm? So we've got to start to look at our social structures and say, what is it that is causing us to be more sedentary, doing things that maybe from an unhealthy lifestyle perspective are in fact causing a lot of these problems that are that are that we're seeing today? Wellness is a is a part of a comprehensive the solution to the healthcare crisis. But if we start to look at where we are today, you know, a $200 program, you're going to have to see about a, what, about a 122% return on investment before you can even start to fathom the idea of it truly helping uh, reduce our healthcare costs. Well, that was a lot. So <laughs> Sorry about that, Jen. I, I, I thought about that just a little bit. <laughs> well, just, I mean, when you think about wellness, it, it can't I mean, sure it can be part of a solution, but I mean, just wellness is so multifaceted in itself, right? Our health is so multifaceted and has all of those influences. Um, I think what I love about that study is that a lot of employers do think wellness is a solution, like it is the solution, right? right? And then they're surprised. Because they've been told that. <laughs> yes, they have for many years and people continue to, to peddle that myth. But that, I think that's what I loved about the study is going, this is a traditional program. This is what people expect. And when it doesn't work out, then they seem to say, oh, well, let's just trash it all. And that's necessarily right. necessarily what we need to do. So I was... If you want to trash something, trash your healthcare plan because <laughs> your health program, that's really what's not working. We 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 kind of proved that for the last 50 years. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you, you, know. you always have to take a look at benefits, but that is always yeah. something. And that can make a difference in your healthcare spend and cost. I mean, there's just so many different levels you can pull and, and and wellness is one, but it's not going to give you that um, ten thousand dollars savings per person. <laughs> no, and there's very little that will because you know we've got genetics and we've got you know unfortunate situations when you have pregnancies that don't go white. Right, and cancer. there's yeah, yeah, got cancer. Car you got perfectly healthy people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
that was actually one of my favorite stories I remember talking to. Uh, I was I was at an event, and the truck bicycle company was talking about you know because I think the conversation was really around you know one of the best ways to reduce some of your healthcare costs is emergency room visits, and the truck bicycle company was like you know we actually don't follow the, the emergency room visits because we encourage people to ride their bikes even to work. And when you ride your bike, you tend to fall off your bike. And when you fall off your bike, you break things. And when you break things, you go to the emergency room. So from our perspective, <laughs> it's just a different mindset because emergency rooms don't necessarily mean we're going to reduce our costs because we are we are encouraging people to be healthier. And when you're healthier, you tend to, you know, especially when it comes to bicycle riding or running and so forth. Uh, my best friend, in the, you know, best man at my wedding was a, is a, and still in, in his 50s, is uh, still running uh, BMX bicycles, you know, or mountain bike racing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I can still remember it was about, I think, I think it was a month after his wedding, he took a major face plant and broke basically half his face. Mm -hmm. And, of course, his wife's first, first comment was, thank God you didn't do that a month before our wedding. So, <laughs> yeah, let's get to the important stuff. <laughs> exactly. But, but, but the point you look at is, is sometimes we do have to look at these things with a much different lens. Mm -hmm. I'm all about taking a look at what's going on. But my attitude has always been, um, and this was back even in my HR days, I looked at the, I looked at, when I looked at prescription spend, prescription medication spends, for instance, I looked at really two things. I looked at medical adherence. In other words, if you are chronic disease, are you taking the pills to manage that chronic disease? And number two, I'm actually going to be looking at those bridge medications, what, you know, what, what some people refer to um, as the statins. I call them bridge medications because I think it's a better word. The idea around these statins were really designed around take this pill so that you can change your lifestyle so that you can get off the pill so you can maintain what's going on. And really, unfortunately, we have Dr. Larry, the cable guy, jumping on the TV and say, ah, just take the Prilosec and keep going. And unfortunately, we hear Dr. Larry, the cable guy, four or five times a day on the TV. We only see our, our primary care physician once, maybe twice a year. So when you, you know, so unfortunately, Dr. Larry, the cable guy, yes, that is my new favorite story, um, really does kind of become part of that marketing. And we've got to be better at marketing what's right by taking that statin and taking those, those bridge medications so that we can actually change the lifestyle. Well, you know, I mean, you, we all know it's so much easier to take a pill than it is to do the things that we need to do for our health. Um, oh, yeah. So let's, uh, let's, let's make sure we do the simple things. Let's not, you know, I, I, was, one of, I, I used to have this old slide and it was all these pills. And then the last slide was this, you know, here's a pill to get off your pills. And, and that, you know, but unfortunately, that is kind of a, a mental attitude. And, 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 it, and it's a struggle because we now live in a society where if you go to your primary care physician for something and, and you've already tapped, you know, you've already typed your, uh, your, your, your medical diagnosis in, in Dr. Google and uh, Dr. Google says that, you know, you have, I don't know, Lyme disease. And then you, you know, you go to your primary care physician and, and they tell you that really what you have is a splinter in your left toe. And they're like, no, I got Lyme disease. And it's like, no, it's a splinter. Um, so that's, that's some of the struggles that we have. And again, going back to where it is, this is where some of our technology is maybe taking us in a, in a direction that, that is a struggle. Now, at the same time, I think it's good to actually go in with a little bit better knowledge of what, what you're, you know, what you're dealing with. But you know, I'm still going to take the uh, medical doctor's prognosis, and it, unless I don't feel like it's exactly right, and then you can always, you know, go take a look at, and 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 get a second opinion. But that's just kind of the attitude I take. Now, I'm very fortunate. I come from a family where my one my my one grandfather was a medical doctor. My other grandfather was a pharmacist. So I, I do come from a very medically oriented organization, even though I could not have passed chemistry in college if my life depended on it. You so it direction. definitely a good direction. Yeah. Direction. <laughs> I, I, I went the math route. I didn't go, I didn't go the medical route. Luckily okay. my wife and my daughter, they, they went down that path and, 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 uh, and, uh, so we're, we're very fortunate in that regards. Well, the world needs all types. So absolutely. 
one of the things too, like that you, another LinkedIn article, but also your, your conference theme is reimagining wellness. It's not quite yeah. redesigning wellness, but it's reimagining wellness. And I love that. That's Absolutely. A, I love that that's a theme for your upcoming conference. But, um, you know, what do you see in that? Because when I was looking, I actually, I, I pulled this out because I'm going to say, uh, pull this out from your article because I want to understand kind of what you think about when you think about reimagining wellness, although I've picked up some from this interview. And you said, um, Today, too many people consider wellness to be health or disease management. Wellness is about functioning opt- optimally. So let's work together to reimagine wellness. And you talked a little bit about um, being informed about how wellness and health connect. So when you set that theme or your team set that theme, kind of what's behind that? And how do, how do you think wellness should be reimagined or could be? You know, again, I think it goes back to we manage what we measure. And right now, we, in my opinion, the only measurements that we're seeing, particularly, you know, in Dr. Song's and Dr. Beaker's research is a perfect example. We're just looking at the health outcome side of things. Mm -hmm. And I think we have got to be a much broader picture. We've got to look at the economic development, the recruitment and retention. I can tell you from a workplace perspective, the best information, the best, the best data that I had when I was in HR was absentee data. And, you know, then a lot of people are like, oh, we just have a big PTO and that's it. So we really can't do anything. Well, yes, you can. Because there are these things. It's called scheduled and unscheduled absences. A scheduled absence is, guess what? I already know I'm going to do something over spring break. I've already put that time in. That's scheduled absence. Usually it's something that happens maybe two weeks or later. Unscheduled absences are those things that happen that day, or, you know, within a 24-hour period of time. These are the things that frustrate and annoy your frontline supervisors and your management because now all of a sudden they have to reconfigure how to get the job done. That throws everybody else into a, into a, into a scurry because, you know, now all of a sudden you're one short or maybe you're multiple short, especially during flu season. So when you start to look at it from a slightly different perspective, there are three reasons why people don't want to come to work. They're sick. Somebody in their family is sick. They don't want to be there. So once you start to look at it from that perspective, you can start to drill down in each one of those. You're sick. Okay, is it a chronic disease? Is it a genetic chronic disease? Is it a lifestyle chronic disease? You just have the flu. You know, same thing with the, with the family. But when you get to that, I don't want to come to work. Is it a mental health day? Is it you don't like your supervisor? Is it you don't like the organization? Is it you don't like your job? There's so many different avenues that you can kind of go down and it's a path, but it starts with that information. And I can tell you, even when I was in HR, I saw a pattern. There was a couple of times when I saw a pattern of somebody that tended to show up or tended to have absenteeisms <laughs> about once a month on a Monday. Mm-hmm. So they were just turning it into three-day weekends. Those are the yeah, things where you start to, yeah, you can start to build. Friday and Monday, yep. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. You got the weekend flu. Um, and, and, and so those are the kind of things that you can start to really start to look at. And, and instead of spending, say, fifty or $60,000 on some of these health informatics programs, let's take some of that data or some of that information that, that's, that's already there and, and very basic and let's see if we can actually make some changes because let's face it, wellness budgets are very tight. And if you're spending, you know, a, a substantial amount of money on some of the health analytics, which I'm not saying are important, but I know a lot of companies that, that struggled, you know, doing any information with biometric screens. What, what, what are they going to be doing with even bigger, broader information? I love this stuff. I think it's great. I think it's critical. But you've got to really see what it is that you can do from an organization. Maybe let your broker, maybe let your... Uh, you know, your, your, your outside consultants uh, really focus in on some of those pieces. You need to be, and internally, you need to be that champion that's driving, um, you know, the initiatives, the programs, the tools, the resources, make sure that people are trained so that they can make those things happen. That to me is where I think the money hits the road. So looking at it from absenteeism, looking at it from an economic development perspective, looking at it from a recruitment and retention piece, understanding the, the performance aspect of it. Seeing, you know, where do you have uh, specific turnover and, and, and what's going on there from the workplace, from the employer side, or I'm sorry, from the community side, I think it's things like rent versus buy, you know, uh, you know, uh, public transportation, all the social determinants of health, access, access to health, 
access to food, nutritious foods, and so forth. These are the kind of things that we've got to start to bring into the table. And it's exciting to see more companies, especially carriers now, starting to use social determinants of health as, as a key factor of success, because those do mean a lot more in what's going on. So I'm excited about seeing a, a bigger measurement of, of what's going on, because if we, if we continue to see, you know, do wellness programs and measure it with health outcomes, we're going to continue to see no success. Yes, absolutely. And so at your conference, who like kind of, you're going to have that theme. Tell us a little bit more about the conference. Here's, here's your chance to plug it. <laughs> <laughs> Come on down to Orlando. Um, you know, it's a great area. Um, yeah, Orlando in July might be a little warm, but I know the uh, hotel itself's got great air conditioning. You know, really what we're looking at with, with that or with, with that conference this year in 2020 is we're really going to be building a lot more of this kind of interactive uh, learning environment. We want to, you know, we've got a number of exhibitors this year that are going to be much more interactive in what's going on. So it's not just going to be a, hi, how are you? Here's a paper, uh, you know, put it in your bag and, and, and move forward. We really want to kind of build a more interactive piece. We're going to start to kind of really look at all the wellness competency models. So if you really look at what NWI has, we have our six dimensions of wellness, and then we have our five uh, health promotion competency models. Our speakers are going to be much more uh, geared towards the competency side of things as opposed to just talking about the dimensions. We want you to walk away with more action items in 2020 after our conference than you are about just the, the, the thought leadership. That We can't get the thought leadership in there. In, and again, I would love to be able to say who our, our keynote speakers are, but we haven't quite got them under contract yet. But I can tell you our our first one, she herself has had to reimagine her own life coming from a uh, perspective of being a world-class athlete and then being a cancer survivor and now being, you know, a family person. So it's going to be, a, you know, it's going to be really neat to see that conversation. Our, our second day keynote is going to be bringing the research. It's going to be bringing a lot of the information of what, what we've been talking about today, not only from a United States, but from a global perspective. And we're really excited about that. We're looking at kind of having a lot more of the interactive, uh, you know, conversations, building uh, off of, of, of some of our, our key pieces of what we're trying to do from, a, from that reimagining perspective. Still going to have a lot of, you know, your basic traditional things, but at the same time, kind of incorporate what we need to do to evolve and move it, moving it forward. So could not be more excited about uh, where the conference is right now, but more importantly, it's getting us there and, and continuing that journey uh, from 2020 to 2030 and, and seeing what we can do as a team, as an organization, but, but also collectively as a tribe. And, and, and I love that term because I think it's very important. Absolutely. Yes. Well, Chuck, if, if you had to give wellness professionals who are listening one thing to walk away with, one action step from our conversation, what would that be? Be creative. And, and, and really what I mean by that is not necessarily in a, in a way that, 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 that's going to be, you know, cause you, cause you to, 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 to be looked at and saying, what the heck are you thinking? <laughs> it's more about being creative, being curious I, it, and, and, and being understanding of what's going on. You know, I'm all about, let's say, if you're doing four programs for wellness at the workplace, for instance, you know, do three traditional and then do one, maybe a little bit, uh, a little bit out there. If you're in the communities, you know, let's talk about some of the policies and the environment that are be going on. Um, you know, where are you from a, from a, a perspective of of where things are are happening? Um, I'm most excited about coming up this summer. You're going to see Dr. Jerome Adams, our, our Surgeon General, coming out with his Community Health for Economic Prosperity uh, process, and this is a really cool opportunity to really understand how economics and 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 health really align with each other and get curious about what's going on there and see how you can start to un understand how that works. And again, finally, if you're a community person, start working alongside of the workplace. If you're a workplace person, start working alongside the community, because when we do those and we make those things happen together, let's face it, 
that's when we will see optimal functioning of our people. Yes, and I think curiosity is one of the skills we should all have and can really help us grow um, personally and professionally. So great advice. It's, it's my word of the year, in my opinion. Uh, curiosity is my word of the year. I'm My goal this year is to do some things that I would not necessarily, that, that are not in my comfort zone. Um, so I'm, I'm really interesting to see where, where some of those things happen. Wait, do you have anything already on the agenda or are you just going to do it like <laughs> as you feel it, it come to you? You know, I think the biggest curiosity, my, my biggest thing is my daughter is a senior in high school and in her last semester of high school. So my wife and I are going to be reimagining life yes, <laughs> over it's the empty summer. Masters, huh? Exactly. So when we start to look at it from just a slightly different perspective, that's definitely going to be out of my comfort zone and, and understanding where that's going. Looks like I'm going to be traveling a little bit more with the job. So Maybe I get out there and try some foods that I maybe have never tried. Nothing in particular, but yeah, it, it's definitely going to be that. Um, a year ago, year and a half ago, I started doing yoga. Um, the first time I tried yoga, 10 minutes into it, I'm like, I'm bored. Mm. Um, <laughs> yep. and, and, and now I got to admit, I finally learned how to relax and I've learned how to bring my chi in. <laughs> and, and now I love yoga and, 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 you know, being a six foot two, 240 pound linebacker, well, I'll tell you what, when I'm done, it makes me feel so much better. So these are the kind of things that I want to do is I want to kind of find those things that, you know, get me excited, make me feel better. So Obviously, Chuck, maybe, I'm also maybe buying... you can lead yoga at the conference this summer. I, I will not lead yoga because <laughs> that's uncomfortable, right? It, no, it, it it would be too funny. Um, <laughs> I, I I wouldn't know exactly where to start. I think we would be in downward dog the whole time. Um, or no, 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 we'd be in child pose the whole time. That's that's the most that's the best one. Um, <laughs> so so, but you know what? I'm more than happy. You know, I I, I will tell you about five years ago, Zanya Foco. Uh, got me on the stage when I was at the Bonus Council of Indiana, and there I was bouncing and bounce, bouncing around. And if you know Zanya, she's about five foot nothing and about a hundred nothing. And when you got a six foot two, two hundred and forty pound boy, um, I made that stage bounce. And uh, but you know what? I'm all in, and uh, I, I'm I'm more than happy to do those kind of things. And and that's what gets me excited. Well, fantastic. Well, Chuck, how can people find out more about you or get in contact with you? You know. Check out my LinkedIn profile, Chuck Gillespie. Uh, it usually pops up one of the top ones there. And uh, nationalwellness.org. And if you feel free to uh, email me, my email address is chuck at nationalwellness.org. Thanks so much, Chuck. I really appreciate your time today. Look forward to talking to you many more times, Jen. And uh, let me know if we need to do anything else. Sounds like a plan. One of the things I frequently hear from wellness professionals is that they want a tribe. They want to find their people. In other words, a place where they can express their opinion without getting chastised for it and where they can get support when they're butting up against the old wellness paradigm. If you're looking for that safe space, come and join us in the Redesigning Wellness community on Facebook. To find us, you can just go to Facebook and in the search bar, type Redesigning Wellness Community and it'll pop right up. You'll just have to answer a couple questions and I'll let you right in. I'd love to see you there.